I'd like to introduce Loretta Zillas, our Buddha House curator, who has offered to speak to us today and to take us on an armchair journey through the life and times of Ernest Labini, someone most of us will have a few ideas about. However, I'm sure Loretta will bring us many insights into how Ernest, colonial jeweller and goldsmith, went about his everyday life here at Buda, far from his Hungarian homeland. Reflecting her own long and deep association with Buda and its fascinating history. Please enjoy the ride. Thank you, Bronwyn. I hope everybody can hear okay, just say if not. Um, and thank you for all coming out. I'd like to make a special mention, wonderful to have some of the Lavini family here today. John and Elizabeth Lavini and uh, Dennis and Helen Lavini. So it's wonderful that you could come along today as well. Today I'm going to share with you some of the research I've compiled to date on the life and times of Ernest Lavini. I'm particularly interested and have become very interested in this gentleman over many years here and uh, just find that at every turn there's another unanswered question. So who was Ernest Lavini? Ernest's remarkable story is one of opportunity and success, beginning in Europe and ending in the Victorian gold boom town of Castlemaine, where his family home named Buda after Budapest uh, in Hungary remains today. Lavini typified the universal man of the Victorian era with a taste for travel and adventure, a keen interest in the arts and sciences and aspirations of success and fortune. Like any of us really. During his lifetime he excelled as a gold and silversmith and jeweller, made many friends, was very successful in business and left behind a unique gentleman's villa residence with a three acre garden where two generations of his family resided up until 1981. One, it's a wonderful thing about Buda uh, that it, many of the Lavini family belongings remain intact within the house, uh, quite a rarity in many house museums the world over. This includes personal documents, correspondence, diaries, family photographs, domestic items, furnishings, books, artworks and artistic objects both made and collected by the creative Lavini family members. As I've worked on the cataloguing, documenting and rehousing of the family's belongings over many years, there are a number of items that have caught my attention, inviting the investigator in me to delve deeper into the life and work of Mr Lavini. Nearly 20 years on, I'm still discovering something new about this interesting gentleman through the collection here at Buda. So, Ernest's humble beginnings uh, were in a historic village of Zepes Zombat, which is the Hungarian name for the town in northern Hungary at the time, also called Georgenburg, and also or now known as Spitska Sobota, which is uh, located in Slovakia. Uh, he was born there in 1818 and his father, Endre, was an advocate or lawyer. The Carpathian Mountains regions, which are in the north of Hungary, were rich in gold and silver, which was mined during the 10th and 11th centuries. Not many people realise that. Most of the gold used in Europe during the Middle Ages came from Hungary. Hungarian gold and silversmiths were highly skilled craftsmen, serving the Magyar nobility and creating objects for both ecclesiastical and secular use. So Lavini had come from a long tradition of both the mining and working of precious metals. You can see here pictured uh, part of the, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire when Lavini was born and the borders are quite vast there. And after the, the two world wars, Hungary is diminished in size to roughly half the size it was. Where Lavini was born was in this northern region here, just south of the Tatram Mountains, which is the highest part of the Carpathian Mountains, in a little town uh, near Poprad. And Poprad was a centre for, for gold and silver smithing in the early days. So it doesn't come as a surprise, really, that that was the trade that Ernest Lavini took up. So that's now part of Slovakia, as I mentioned. Here's a photograph at the top here of Zepis Zombat, in 1875, uh, so after Hungary had become its own state. 
Uh, and we think that this was sent to Levini from his friend in Hungary, Kronberg, who'd worked here with him on the gold fields in the early days and returned to Hungary. So Levini was apprenticed as a silversmith and jeweller in Budapest, uh, probably at the age of around 15 years. And uh, that was a, a, in about 1840, he was working in Budapest. Uh, Pest is actually on the eastern side of the Danube River, River, and that was the commercial part of the city. An apprenticeship in those days meant seven years living in with your master, and then a further three years and one day, to be precise, working as a journeyman to broaden your skills working in other workshops. In order to be recognised as a master of your trade, you were required to finish a major piece in precious metals that would be presented to the Guild for admission. So that was quite a long process, and Lavini pretty much followed that process throughout his whole career, including the time he spent in Australia. How we know where Ernest was and at what time, roughly, is due to this tiny little box here, a little souvenir box, which we recently had restored, that was full of little notes of well wishes and uh, thank yous and wishing Lavini all the best on his travel. Travels are two here at the bottom of Chosen from 1840, and that's when these little well-wish notes were commenced. And most of those were written uh, from people who were living in Pest, either friends or colleagues of Lavini, we assume. But they're beautiful little notes. And uh, the one over here that says, good fortune is unstable. The times they are changing. Friends are few in between. And my friend, how are things with you? by his friend Martin Witchen, uh, which really epitomises to me what was to come in Lavini's life. There were a lot of trials and tribulations as well as the successes uh, that he came across, and, and that to me encapsulates what was to come. Uh, so that man was very astute. But, but all the notes are quite lovely, little uh, memories and memoirs and sayings, etc., to send Lavini on his way. The other thing that's always fascinated me, and I've never really understood it till I started doing some research on journeymen, is this darling little illustration that I'm pretty sure was done by Lavini, um, which illustrates the journeyman. Uh, it's, it's quite a thing in Europe, this journeyman's tradition, where you have the two men shaking hands, and I don't know that whether that's to represent uh, a change from a tradesman to a gentleman or how, how it actually works, but the signpost there is Pest and Paris. So to me, it sort of tells me that Lavini was on the crossroads of his life, heading to Paris, and apparently he went to Paris with the dream that he'd become an artist. So it was a very interesting time, and I sort of see it as from the clothing that there's a gentleman on one side and what looks like a bohemian artist-type dress on the other. So that's the way I read it at the moment. But I actually found that little slip of paper in one of Dor uh, Gertrude Levini's little sketchbooks, and it, it didn't sit there. And then I realised it's the same size as all the other little notes. So in fact, Gertrude had taken it from her father's souvenir notes and pasted it in her own little sketchbook. Uh, but now it's back where it belongs, really, and it, it's definitely uh, in Levini's hand, I feel. So a very important little thing there. So now we move to Paris. Paris was a very interesting place at that time. He spent three years on the road uh, from 1840 to 1843. From those little notes, I can gather that he was in Vienna, Germany, Luxembourg, and probably Italy, according to Hilda Levini's um, memoirs. And it would make sense that he would have travelled to Italy as a man interested in studying his trades, silversmithing and goldsmithing, etc. Paris at this time was uh, under the reign of King Louis Philippe from 1830 to 1848 and this was known as the reign of the boutique, uh, Paris being the European centre for fashion and luxury goods. The population at that time was close to a million people, so very different from where Lavini had come from. And France had embraced the industrial age with the rebuilding of Paris landmarks and architectural restoration on buildings such as Saint Germain's Church, the Palais Royal, and finishing off some of Napoleon's incompleted structures such as L'Arc de Triomphe. 
This period saw vast improvements in the city layout, train travel, growth of manufacturing and a fast growing middle class as well as the appearance of the Bohemian artists. This is a wonderful album that is in the collection here at Buda, Views of Paris, beautiful set of lithographs uh, after the daguerreotype photographs, which of course photography was all the rage at this time. But these were made into lithographs and we have the album there. Uh, and it's just interesting to notice that most of the buildings that are in that album are what uh, the restoration works that were occurring on the buildings at this time. So it's really quite pertinent in the history of Paris. Uh, that we have this. I don't know, I haven't found out yet how rare it is, but we do have quite a number of very rare books that Lavini owned that we have in the collection here, so we're very lucky. We also know that he went up in a hot air balloon. So there you are. The hot air balloons had been around for a while, but uh, people going up in them, it must have cost a, a pretty penny, I would say, but he obviously needed to, to do that. He had a lifelong interest in science and modern technology and it seems that the craze for hot air ballooning and photography were rife and that's shown in this lovely little humorous illustration down here in the bottom. I'm sorry I didn't have a, a better quality copy of it but uh, it's by an artist called Théodore Morissette entitled La Daguerreotype Mania from 1840 depicting all manner of modern inventions on the go and a large number of photographic artists carting all their boxes of equipment around and their carts etc trying desperately to capture all the activity that was going on so it really gives you a feel of what was happening around that time and the excitement of all the modern things that were going on and Lavini was part of that. Here we are at the Chateau de Chambord so what we have in the collection is this incredibly rare photograph. I only know of two others, this here, uh, that are in public collections the world over, as far as we know. Taken in 1843 by William Henry Fox Talbot, who was doing a tour through Paris with his photographic calotype method. So he went to the Chateau de Chambord and photographed it and we have one of those photographs in the collection. The only reason it survived and the reason why you will never see the original on display in the house at Buda is because light will kill it. It will disappear completely if it's exposed to light. It's so fragile. So in fact it's been very fortunate that it's been tucked away in a box you know, for years and, and not seen the light of day. Uh, but I was lucky enough in uh, 2014 to go and visit uh, the Chateau de Chambord and, and it's still there and it looks still very much the same so it's fantastic to see it. There was a bit of restoration going on on the roof there. Fascinating building. It wasn't, I don't know whether anybody's been there uh, but it, it, nobody could live in it. It was built in a marsh. In summer it was infested with mosquitoes. Uh, this huge cold stone building. Looks fantastic from the outside but really totally unlivable but it's still there and you can still visit it now. Uh, but the rooftop extraordinarily <coughs> was built to look like the skyline of Constantinople. And when you think of it in terms of that, what an amazing thing to try to mimic and how wonderful. If you're there, you must go up on the roof. I went up on the roof and it was just the most amazing thing to be, to be up there amongst all those turrets and things. But it's over the top, yes, well, you know, that's the French for you. But, uh, yeah, it's still there and it was, it's a fantastic place to visit. Anyway, so I just thought... I have, uh, over the years, been trying to travel in some of the footsteps of Lavini just due to the interest that's created in me. So, What we have in the collection that's remnant from, we believe, um, the Paris period, and it's over many years I've spoken with a number of people who've taken an interest in this, little bits and pieces. Uh, one of the first things up the top there is uh, a page from the Manual of Jew the Jeweller and the Goldsmith, produced in 1832 by... Julia de Fontenelle, and that was the Bible of the metal smith in those days, but produced within uh, Lavini's lifetime, which is interesting. I just can't find the rest of the book. That's the problem. So I don't know what happened to it, but uh, I'm sure he would have had a copy and kept it with him everywhere he went and obviously brought it here out to Australia with him as well. There's two little tableaus you will be familiar with, anybody that knows the house. They've been carved out of the wax, the red wax that the silversmith used to actually create their work that gets lost 
when they make the mould to cast the metal. So it's called the lost wax process, and this is the wax that starts the process. Fact is that Levini created these, but either couldn't bring himself to destroy them, or he was so proud of them, and so he should have been, that he decided to keep them and frame them and bring them out with him. But they're very much in the Gothic style and the French style, so we assume that they probably were done around that time while he was still um, gaining knowledge of his trade, etc. But they are marvellous little things. It just shows the incredible amount of skill and detail he had in creating his work. These other little items I've put in there, just little bits and pieces taken from books or I'm not sure exactly where they've come from. I haven't located the source of these things, but you can see the Gothic style coming through in Lavini's own creation. So they might have been things he was copying as he was learning his trade, etc. Uh, so just a, a bit of interest. Up the top there, we've got this a lovely little frame that Hilda says was made by Ernest, and I don't doubt it, uh, but very much in the French Rococo style. <coughs> little uh, cherubs everywhere and very ornate. Uh, it's on display at the moment in a glass cabinet, so it's worth having a closer look at. And this lovely little <clears throat> silver cast of a Napoleon, and I don't know where it is. It was in the collection in the 1970s when Hilda was still living here, but it, it wasn't here when the art gallery took over the ownership of the house in 1981. We do know that Hilda sold some things and she did give some things away. But if anyone's out there and finds it, let me know. I'll find the money to get it. So we, we need to, to have some of these items that are now lost back. It'd be great to have them back here. Then Lavini took off to London. Um, we, we don't know why, uh, but there was a lot of civic unrest uh, in Europe at the time. Um, a lot of revolution in the air, including in France. Uh, people didn't like Louis Philippe. They were about ready to overturn the monarchy again. And in 1848, Louis Philippe, uh, Philippe abdicated and went and lived in uh, England. Uh, so this was all happening. I mean, it was also the time when um, Hugo, Victor Hugo was writing Les Mis, you know, about the uprisings of the 1830s in Paris as well. That could have been one of the reasons uh, why Lavini decided to up and, and head off to London. Also, um, London, he was probably not taking such a risk starting up a business there because Londoners and people in England wanted continental objects. So silversmiths and jewellers who came from the continent were going to do well in business, even though they probably wouldn't be admitted to the Guild in England because they didn't want foreigners coming in and taking their business. But uh, I, I don't know whether he already knew somebody over there. Not sure about that. Anyway, it wasn't a bad move that he made to London. Um, he set up business with Frederick Booker, who was a, a, a Russian jeweller and antiquarian, uh, and they had a very successful business there. Uh, in the collection here at Buda, a very rare thing to have. And we're very lucky to have them, and they're incredibly creative and artistic. They were beautiful. We also know that he was selling them on to other jewellery firms. So he wasn't just manufacturing jewellery and designing jewellery there. He was selling on the designs to other companies as well. So obviously he was very well respected in the trade. It wasn't long uh, before the Hungarian Revolution uh, was happening in 1848, uh, and in 1849, refugees from Hungary were seeking uh, refuge in London, and Lavini apparently helped a lot of them out, which is, is uh, really great. Not surprising, really. He made friends easily, and he was, he was a very kind-hearted man from the history that we have gathered together on him and his generosity. Uh, so it's just interesting to note that that was happening as well at that time and that he was there to help support. And he befriended quite a number of the refugees uh, that were in London at the time. Yes, uh, it was, uh, they were actually eventually given sponsorship by both the American and the English government uh, to immigrate the um, Hungarian refugees. So many of them went to America and after the gold discoveries of 1851 some opted 
to go, come out to Australia and they were allowed to do that. So it interests me that there were Hungarians already on the gold fields before Levini made the decision to come out. It may have helped him make that decision. Uh, he was obviously knew uh, Jacinth Rone, who was a very famous uh, Benedictine monk, author, scientist and patriot, and he wrote this beautiful little note uh, for Levini uh, on uh, Levini leaving. Uh, Rone stayed in London uh, for quite a few years after and, and only returned to Hungary in 1866, where he was um, given the title of bishop. Uh, another person who was there was Kossuth, who was one of the leaders of the revolution uh, and he'd taken refuge, I think, in Turkey before coming to London, but he was received with open arms in London and he was a fabulous orator, apparently, and, and uh, yes, was a, he was there as well. So I have no doubt that Levini attended some of his um, talks as well and I wouldn't be surprised if the Hungarians Be Faithful to Your Fun Fatherland was written by, <laughs> by Kossuth. Oh, and uh, Karoli Brocki was apparently already, he's written this beautiful little note, uh, already in London from 1838 and stayed there. He'd already been an expat Hungarian. So Lavini was, uh, knew quite a few Hungarians while he was in London. Besides the discovery of gold in Australia in 1851, uh, there was the Great Exhibition of London and Levini had a role, of course, to play in both of those major events. So the first great exhibition of 1851 was the first major trades fair in the world initiated by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. The magnificent Crystal Palace was built especially to house the exhibits and it embraced and showcased technology and industrial innovation. Uh, and the Victoria and Albert Museum was established as a result of that exhibition. So Levini had designed the Britannia pendant and obviously sold it on to another manufacturer, sh and D Gas, who then made the object with a few little changes to it and entered it into the exhibition. And it was received very well. It was reproduced in the uh, London News at the time, Illustrated London News, which was in the indication that it was an object of great interest. And it was also uh, reproduced in the catalogue of the exhibition. And when I was on the uh, Copland Scholarship in 2016, I had the opportunity to visit a private house called Flintham Hall in Nottinghamshire. And this house is full of objects that were purchased from the 1851 exhibition. So I was already in love with the place before I even got inside and saw everything that they had there, including this huge fireplace. I think you can only just see a bit of it uh, in the photograph there of the uh, reception room. It's massive. It's the size of the wall over there and twice as tall. Um, and that was purchased. How did they move these things and install them? I don't know. Anyway, the house was virtually built around... Uh, some of these objects from the 1851 exhibition and there sitting on the table uh, was the 1851 catalogue so I was in my element. <coughs> they were, I was allowed to flip through it without gloves and do what I wanted. It was They were fascinated that I was so keen. Uh, so I was able to photograph the uh, pendant as it was reproduced in the catalogue as well. So that was a, a really nice little find. Uh, on that trip also, I was fortunate enough to go and meet with Charlotte Gear and Judy Ruddo, who are the authors of the <coughs> Jewellery in the Age of Queen Victoria book. And they had reproduced <coughs> Lavini's Britannia pendant in their book, and I'd made contact with them before I went over and taken over a lot of material, including lots of, of photographs of Lavini's jewellery designs, which we sat down for a couple of hours and happily went through and discussed. And uh, one of the pieces, uh, they looked at each other and said well, is this one, isn't this in the Royal Collection? So a bit more research and I'll hopefully be able to determine that some of Lavini's jewellery pieces might have even ended up in the Royal Collection. So that would be a nice bit of icing on the cake. Uh, I also had the opportunity to go to the um, V&A and 
I spent a couple of days actually just wading through the collection of designs that, were, that came from the Brogdon workshop, Watherston and Brogdon, and we know that Lavini was selling to Watherston and Brogdon. Uh, and as I went through, I virtually photographed everything that I thought was in Lavini's hand because uh, uh, what that told me was that Lavini's um, beautiful jewellery designs were much superior to a lot of the others that were around at the time, and I can easily quite tell his work apart from the other jewellery designs. So uh, there's, I need to go back to that as well and, um, and let them know that they've probably got works by Lavini there, but that'll take a bit of proving, I think, but that's part of the deal. I also spent a, time, a bit of time walking around the back streets looking for 86 Newman Street off Oxford Street, which was where Lavini's workshop was. So the workshop's gone, but I had a lot of fun anyway. So lots of nice little pubs and things down those back streets <laughs> right in the middle of, um, of London. So that was fun time. OK, so we're off to the diggings now. A new phase in Lavini's life. He's 34 years old. He's successful in business, but, you know, maybe a little bit itchy feet. A couple of friends have already gone off to the diggings. Um, Lord uh, Robert Cecil had taken a trip to the diggings in 1852, come through Forest Creek. Apparently, Lavini somehow meets with him or maybe attends a talk he, he's given or something, but Kate Lavini relates that, uh, that, that Ernest asked the English statesman, Lord, later Lord Salisbury, and later, of course, the Prime Minister of England, who'd visited the goldfields, what was it like? And Cecil answered, oh, it's a land of six by two, meaning the diggings look like a graveyard. Uh, and Lavini said, well, I'm going for three years. And so off he went to the goldfields, okay, to try his luck. So he had to wind up the business with Booker. Uh, he also decided that he would... Um, purchase himself a little, oh, I didn't mention the guns. He was uh, apparently given these duelling pistols by a friend or acquaintance, probably a good friend, I'd say, in London, saying, you're going to need these on the gold fields. It's a bit rough out there. But I just need to add that in uh, Lord Cecil's book, which I have a copy of, he says he was surprised at how uh, polite and uh, how lovely the, the, the diggers were on the gold fields. Are much more orderly than a lot that you'd find in London or any big city in England at the time and much cleaner and they observed the Sabbath and, you know, it was fantastic. But he went through in civilian clothes. He didn't go... <laughs> he dressed himself down, he was told, before he came that he needed to just dress... put a, you know, flannel shirt on and, you know, just... Uh, so they didn't realise that he was a statesman. It might have been very different reception. Otherwise, I don't know. Anyway, that's just a, a thought. Uh, but in the meantime, off Lavini went. So I found in the uh, Illustrated London News an example down here of an iron house, a portable iron house. Well, Lavini had a portable iron shed, so he was equipped. He wasn't going to be staying in a tent. We also know that he had equipment, which would have been probably in the form of a steam engine that might have he might have been able to rig up like a sluice or a, um, a puddling, an automatic puddling machine, probably so that they could work the gold diggings easier. Uh, so it would be something like this here, a steam engine. Um, and he set sail with four labourers, two with wives, apparently. Uh, on the SS, the screw steamer Melbourne, in October, um, only weeks after he'd dissolved the uh, business partnership. Uh, we know that also that that ship was twice dismasted on the way out and there was also a mutiny on board where one of the mutineers was killed. So there was a little bit of... Um, argy-bargy, and uh, it wasn't a common thing for a mutiny to occur, because I wondered about that as well. Uh, but they got here, and they were only a day late, arriving in Adelaide. Uh, so he's lucky to get here, I think. Two of the labourers apparently jumped ship in Adelaide, or well, they left the ship and didn't return. So that's jumping ship, isn't it? Yes. And then they came on to... Um, Melbourne and arrived probably about the 8th of February, I think, because on the 9th of February, uh, Lavini wrote to the colonial secretary asking where on earth he could procure land at Forest Creek so that he could set up his machinery, uh, etc., to work the gold. We don't know what the response was yet. We haven't 
got the response, but we, he did come up here, but we don't know whether he got as far as actually setting up his, uh, his machinery. Uh, so apparently the other two labourers also left the party at that stage, whether they left in Melbourne or whether they left when they reached the diggings, we're not sure, but there's a, a lot of misfortune there. And Levini said in, the, in his letter also that if he couldn't set his machinery up, he'd be ruined because it had cost him a fortune. So he'd spent virtually everything he had bringing this stuff out. It was a big risk. Uh, so he must have been absolutely devastated uh, if he couldn't set that up. So next thing was to travel to the gold fields. So I don't know how long he was in Melbourne. He would have had to hire bullock drays to bring the equipment up. Must have been a major, uh, you know, manoeuvre to get everything up. But it's fascinating just to see what Port Melbourne was like in those days, jammed with ships. Most of them had been abandoned, of course, because all the sailors had jumped ship to go off to the diggings. So uh, it was a pretty crazy time. And the, um, the canvas town, I think, was on the... Um, I'm not sure which bank, on the, where the, the art centre was, I think, down that way, on down Port Melbourne and Sandridge, the trek through the Keelor Plains up to the diggings at uh, Forest Creek, Mount Alexander. Here's a fabulous little map of the Mount Alexander region in 1854, uh, so it's a nice early one. Sort of gives you an idea of what, uh, what, was, what it was like. I think it was probably about a three-day walk, three or four-day walk, possibly longer, depending on how much gear you had. So it was quite a trek. Uh, this is what the diggings were like here in Castlemaine uh, in the very early days. You can see that the little house is a half-tent, half-building, and a fabulous painting that belongs to the Pioneers and Residents Association. That's only a portion of it by Stockweller uh, of the township just starting to uh, be built there. So these were the days that Lavini was here. That was what he would have seen and experienced. The diggings wasn't going to work for him. Gold wasn't, he wasn't going to be digging for gold. Apparently the miners threatened to smash up his machinery. They didn't want businesses coming in with machinery and competing with men who were working by hand to dig for gold themselves. They thought that was incredibly unfair. Uh, that was according to Kate that she said that the diggers threatened to smash up the machinery. Also, perhaps that the machinery was not appropriate for the gold, alluvial gold mining that was here. Uh, but to support Kate's, what Kate said, uh, in uh, Raffaello Carboni's book on the Eureka Stockade, he also mentions that the diggers threatened to smash up any machinery. So that supports that theory very well. So Lavini, being an astute businessman decided to go back into business. By 1854, he'd sold that piece of machinery, uh, had started up a business in the market square um, and had, was employing three workers by 1855-56. Frederick Cronberg, who he brought over from London um, in 1855, probably paid his way. Uh, and we've just recently found out he had a, a Swiss watchmaker by the name of Amy Louis Garot working for, for him, very highly reputed Swiss watchmaker, so that was appropriate for a watchmaker's and jeweller's business to be successful, and another fellow called George Farrell who was also uh, a watchmaker and jeweller in the town. And I think that possibly Farrell uh, probably took over Lavini's plant when he retired and, and took... The, the business away um, after 1862-63, so because he remained in business in the town for some time, as did Garrow, but Garrow then moved on. So by 1856, Ernest is looking at building a grand new premises to live in uh, and to work from uh, on the northwest corner of Barker and Moston Streets, uh, and at the time it was, uh, you know, one to equal. Uh, any building or any edifice in Regent Street, London. It had a colossal sheet of glass, a glass window uh, for exhibition there, which was the largest ever procured in a country area in Victoria. So it would have cost a fortune to actually 
uh, get that made. By 1857 it was opened and up and running for business. So within three years virtually, Levini had made it on the gold fields. His timing was impeccable uh, and he went into gold buying very early, which most jewellers and watchmakers did in those days. If you had a business set up, you were buying and selling gold. So no doubt a lot of his money was made in buying and selling gold. And the reason we know that is from a little report in the newspaper from the courts, Castlemaine Courts, where a Chinese uh, digger by the name of Bong uh, was caught stealing from Levini's shop. He'd gone in to sell his gold, got his money, asked to see some rings. Levini had shown him the rings and then some other customers were calling, so Levini put the rings away and Levini went to serve the other customers. And Bong took his opportunity to pop his hand under the counter, grab two rings and took, took off. Well, Levini took off after him. <laughs> so he took off after him and he caught him. And he brought him back. Apparently the Chinaman took him by the hand, showed him where he'd thrown the rings and they went back to the shop and the police came on. So he eventually went to court and had to do 12 months hard labour for that. So, uh, but Levini got his rings back and we now know, <laughs> confirmed, because we haven't seen it advertised anywhere that he was actually buying and selling mm -hmm. gold. I also do have a record, though, of some money transacted uh, where Levini was obviously taking his gold to Melbourne. We think he took his gold by foot. It would have been risky to take it. Uh, by carriage because of bush rangers. Carriages were a target. If he was just dressed plainly and carried his gold and sold it to the gold buyers, uh, jewellers and watchmakers in Melbourne, which is pretty much recorded what he did, then he was probably safer. Uh, there is a little story where the, uh, he was uh, overnight staying in the Gisborne Inn, which was a place where he often stayed when he walked to Melbourne, uh, and the barmaid came in and said, there's bush rangers in the bar, quick run. Now Levini must have had something valuable on him if he decided he had to take off out of the bar that night and he did and he, he went down and apparently just lay down and when he woke up in the morning he found he was only feet away from a, a large ditch so who knows what would have become of him if he'd fallen down the ditch you know just little stories like that and uh, quite amazing. By 1858 he's decided he would like to get married He's already established, got a lovely new building premises uh, where the family can live, etc. Now, uh, Mary Isaacs was his first wife. She arrived on the gold fields in 1858. Um, her two brothers were here, George and Henry, and had a successful wine merchant's business in Templeton Street. Um, her brother, George, was also a JP. Um, and her parents, her father was Isaac Isaacs from Chatham in London and he was a military outfitter and we still have the chest that she would have brought out with her with his label on the inside. So, uh, so Mary was brought out probably through the connection with her brothers to marry Lavini. Um, and uh, they were married late in 1858. The next year she had a little baby boy, Charles Ernest, who unfortunately died the following year and Mary died soon after. So that was another blow to Lavini. We have Mary's Bible here, which was given to her before she left London uh, by her brother-in-law. And then we have handwritten in there a little note in Ernest Levini's own hand about the marriage and then the deaths of both his beloved wife and child. So, and it's in pretty good condition too. It's obviously been sit tucked away in its box for many years and it's, uh, it's quite a, a lovely, just a very small little intimate Bible. Right, now we get on to Levini's masterpieces. So if you want to think of it this way, this was the end of his training was to create at least one masterpiece to show that he was a master now of his trade. By 1855, he had workers helping out in the shop and he was able to start thinking about being creative again. He was also obviously very excited about the prospects of living in Australia uh, and just the opportunities that it had offered him and that had given him a great return already. Uh, so it was the, the gold ink stand on a red gum base that he started in 1855. Incidentally, 1855 was when the Great Paris exhibition was on and there were calls for what could be sent to Paris from the colonies as well. So I've, I've got no doubt really that Levini would have been thinking about that 
when he started making the gold inkstand, thinking, wouldn't this be great if I could get it finished and off to Paris? But it didn't eventuate. Uh, in the meantime, um, it was well written about, which is the reason why we know so much about the piece, because the piece is now lost. We don't know where it is. Uh, so that's another thing we're on the lookout for. Uh, but uh, it's, according to Hilda, she felt that it probably would have been melted down for the gold. Uh, so that would be a dreadful shame, but still, it was a major piece of Australiana when it was made because it had four nuggets of gold from the Ballarat, Miraburra, Bendigo and Castlemaine gold fields with, in the shape of the Southern Cross on the top of it. Uh, and then it had all of these little allegorical figures around it as well, just talking about the commerce and science and the prospects in Australia, as well as a little Aboriginal with a spear on top. So it's quite a, an important piece of Australiana, if it was ever to come to light. Uh, apparently, Leveni was making it with the intent that uh, a public subscription should be raised to actually give it as a gift to Queen Victoria. Uh, but that didn't happen. So in 1861, a public subscription was raised to purchase it, to give to Mr Bruce, who'd built the Melbourne to Bendigo railway line, which was a great thing at the time it happened. They didn't think the railway was going to come through Castlemaine, and they fought tooth and nail to get it to come through, uh, and it did, so it was a really big thing for Castlemaine to get the railway. Uh, so they were very grateful to Mr Bruce. In 1858, it was first exhibited. 1861, sold and given to Mr Bruce. 1861, it was also exhibited in Melbourne. Uh, and from there, it was chosen to actually go to the International Exhibition in London in 1862, where it was received to great acclaim and reproduced in that catalogue as well. So uh, that's uh, the illustration from that catalogue and that's an original photograph of the ink stand that we have in the collection. Uh, a couple of years later, about 1859-60, uh, he completed his second masterpiece, which was the Silver Standing Cup. Many of the little uh, mouldings are similar to the ones on the, that appeared on the gold ink stand. So, uh, we've got the little gold miner here on the base, the agriculturist, uh, the symbol of commerce and the little Aboriginal around the other side. Um, and up at the top, uh, the symbol of commerce and the little blob of gold there just showing prospects of commerce in Australia around gold. So they tell quite a story uh, about uh, Australia and where, you know, how the prospects were here for, for building a fabulous new nation. This piece was purchased by subscription and given to Mr Charles Saint, who was the first editor and owner of the Mount Alexander Mail newspaper and a great friend of Lavini's. It was given to him when he was leaving Castlemaine in 1864 and on his death, he had no children, he wanted it to go to the, the city of Bristol where he'd come from in England and it was donated by his widow there and then it disappeared for many, many years. And it wasn't, I, I think the chain of events was that uh, Dr Egon Kunz came and visited the Levini women here in uh, 1960 to ask them about their father and, and his Hungarian roots and it was that that stirred uh, the Levini women to actually try and find out where had the Silver Standing Cup then ended up? Had it in fact been donated to Bristol? Uh, and was it still there and where was it? And nobody seemed to know. They had sent letters to try and find out and Hilda had been there and tried to find it uh, when she visited England and nobody knew anything about it anyway. It turned up at a Sotheby's auction in 1970 uh, and the National Gallery was ready uh, to buy it and had the money, which was fantastic. So it's now exhibited permanently at Federation Square as a major piece of Australian silver. So that was fortuitous. Let's hope that one day the gold ink stand might turn up as well. <laughs> you just don't know. Still hold out hope. These are a couple of other things that we have in the collection, remnant of Ernest Lavini's work. He would have been making jewellery because uh, out of the gold because diggers wanted that. They wanted their uh, gold nuggets often made into jewellery. But because Lavini never signed his work, we, we don't know what was made by him and what wasn't made by him, so it's very hard to tell. Uh, but the National Gallery of Victoria has the beautiful uh, gold bracelet with the garnet 
in the centre here. And a couple of years ago, a lady said to me, uh, she'd come up uh, with the Silver Society, and she said, would you like to see my Lavini bracelet? Uh, and I thought, oh, yes, I've seen some Lavini bracelets before, but yes, yes, I'll have a look. And I was a little gobsmacked when she showed it to me because of its similarity to the piece that's in the National Gallery's collection. Well, that piece now belongs to us. It was donated through her uh, and the um, cultural gifts uh, run by the government. So we're very lucky to have that in our collection now. That's the gold with the emeralds there. Uh, so some other little pieces that were made by Lavini as well. So I feel that, uh, blessed that we've at least got a few things here uh, that uh, were Lavini's for sure, have a provenance. Okay. Some other things that belong to other people. Um, it's nice to track things down. The silver trowel that was used for the opening of the Mechanics Institute here in Castlemaine, engraved by Lavini. Uh, apparently this little medal and award for red wine by a local uh, wine grower, E. Schroeder, uh, that the, the art gallery believes was engraved by Lavini, although it's a little bit later than he, uh, he'd finished up in 1863. Uh, the clock that was down at the railway station with Lavini's name on it, Another piece of jewellery is supposed to have been made by Lavini in a private collection. I don't know who that belongs to, but it's a very nice piece. Apparently, it depicts a scene from the Botanical Gardens here in Castlemaine. That was according to um, Hilda Lavini when she saw it. Uh, she said, oh, that's the Botanical Gardens. It's got the bridge and the trees. She's, she's recognised it as that and felt that that would be uh, what it was. And a, prop, a clock that was in private hands, I know it was in the Bailieu family's collection until fairly recently, but it's interesting that it's got on the face E. Lavini, uh, London and Castlemaine. So it makes me think that it could have been uh, made before 1855, because until 1855, Lavini was planning to go back to London. Um, so, and it was in 1855 that he also became a naturalised citizen and he also started purchasing land in Castlemaine. So by that time, I think he'd pretty much decided he was staying. Uh, there's some more little pieces. Some of these are lost. The silver standing cup is the one that was given to Saint, which is on the, on the uh, right-hand side there, with the top of it just lying next to it. The little emu egg, another emu egg, mounted uh, emu egg in silver there that was given to Saint, which we don't know the whereabouts of. And these are some of the, some of the little castings that I mentioned were in the collection uh, when Hilda was alive in the 1970s, but have now... Uh, gone missing, so we're on the on the search for those. Some of them are mouldings that he used on the silver standing cup and the gold ink stand, etc. They probably would have been castings that were seconds uh, that weren't used because they weren't perfect. So, in 1863, Ernest was about 44 years old. He retired from business. He sold two major works. Uh, which one of them, I think, was sold for £500, which was the price he paid for Delhi Villa. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, he obviously had mining and property interests. He didn't need to work anymore. I also think that by the time he was 44, maybe the eyes and the hands weren't as good as they used to be. Um, so he didn't really need to work anymore, which is a shame in some ways. Uh, but good for him. So he purchased Delhi Villa in 1863 at auction, the most expensive piece of real estate sold in Castlemaine at that time, so prime position. And in 1864, he married his second wife, Bertha Lavini, in Launceston, Tasmania. Uh, Bertha's brothers were on the goldfields as well, so we think another goldfields connection had brought the two together because that's the thing that a lot of people ask, well, if she lived in... Launceston, how did Lavini get to meet her? Because he didn't have contacts in Tasmania that we know of, etc. So again, through the brothers, uh, that meeting would have occurred and the marriage came about. You can just see at the front of the house there, I can make out Lavini uh, down, or you can, if you look very closely, and there's a lady standing on the steps, which probably is Bertha, and two little children in there. Uh, we've got a couple of photographs dating from 1869, so, and they've both got Lavini in them, which is great. Okay, not many other family photos, unfortunately. Uh, 
uh, it must have just been opportune or when something happened that Levini, uh, like building extensions or completion of extensions or a marriage, etc., that uh, we have photographs and very few photographs, unfortunately, of the interior of the house. Uh, but in this little photograph of the family here, you can see one of the mounted uh, emu eggs there on the side. And we still have the screen, the fire screen and the chair that mother's sitting on there. But it's the parents with the six daughters. By that time, the sons were probably off at boarding school or off doing their own thing. They were a little bit older. So that's possibly a reason why the boys aren't pictured in the photograph. So, uh, but what we have is great. And this one came to light in the very collection of photographs that have been reproduced and are available on, at the library now to look through. And it's after the tornado it swept through and cut a path right through Buda in 1901 and took all the chimneys out and the roof off and, and the ceilings, etc. So it's fantastic that we've actually got that photograph uh, because the roof was changed at that time, but we also then know the age of the existing roof, etc. So it's, it's good from that point of view. Ernest's involvement with the community um, keep coming to light. Um, the newspapers available through Trove are, are constantly being digitised and updated, which is great. So the more that happens, the more references we have to what he was doing within the community. Uh, and it was quite substantial. He was obviously very active and engaged uh, with what was going on in the town and very excited about the prospects of the town. At the time that Castlemaine uh, started, it was going to be the great centre. It was going to be the biggest inland city uh, in Australia. Uh, it was only when the alluvial gold ran out and the quartz, deep lead quartz mining in Ballarat and Bendigo took off that those two cities really took off and Castlemaine remained the same, which in my mind is a good thing because mm -hmm. Castlemaine, as it is, is beautiful. Um, and Ballarat and Bendigo had their new buildings built in the boom of the 1870s, 80s and 90s. Uh, but Levini had his family here and obviously decided that this was where he was going to stay. Um, he had his home, uh, etc. and he was entrenched in the community. So uh, that's fortunate for us, I think. He did have plans to build a grand new villa home. He bought I think it was six acres, it was twice the size of uh, what Buddha is today, up in Hargrave Street where the home Kawika now stands. Uh, he laid out the garden and started planting the garden up. He, we have numerous designs, probably about eight or ten designs of different style villa houses. This is one, uh, only one of the house which we believe he drew himself uh, with the floor plan of the house for the new dwelling that he wanted to build. So the plans were being developed in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, the uh, land was purchased in the mid-1870s. Uh, he was really going for it. Uh, this was how he was spending a lot of his time. This was the garden plan uh, with orchards, vegetable gardens, berry, uh, berry vines and things all planted around the garden and a beautiful almost a piece of jewellery <laughs> for the front garden here. And he, as I say, he had started planting it out as well. But apparently Hilda decided that she was not going... Sorry, Bertha decided she was not going to move from Buda. So that was done. Obviously, Bertha ruled the roost in that way. And so the family stayed at Buda. He eventually sold the land in the mid-1890s, but during the early 1890s he expanded Buda from what was a one-acre property to a three-acre property and designed the extensions for the house. So all the wings were added at that time. Uh, there was more work uh, to the kitchen, which was originally the miners' cottage that was on the site before Delhi Villa was built, and made this his, his villa, gentleman's villa home. This is a great little photo here of the uh, pleasure garden just being laid out probably soon after that land was purchased. Uh, so that's a very early photograph of the pleasure garden area there. Property ownership. It was purported that he owned about 43 properties <laughs> during the 18, late 1880s, uh, including a number in the CBD, of course, which he was collecting rents from, um, 25 in other rural locations. I think he was having a bet each way 
as land came up and there was mentions of more gold digging happening, he wasn't going to miss out. So he was taking the opportunity to purchase land in little areas where there were pockets of gold. That is one thing that jumps out at me. Um, and, and one in Preston, down in Melbourne, Jika Jika. So, uh, but by the time of his death, they'd been substantially reduced. Um, so that's interesting to know, but still there was quite a lot left and, and the family were well off, you know, well looked after on his death. He was also involved, as mentioned, in the mining companies. Uh, these ones listed down here, and probably others on and off, um, and that'll come to light too as more information through Trive comes to light. Uh, but I did find this lovely little illustration of um, the Ajax mine directors. <laughs> By the look of the mutton chops on the fellow on the right, I'd hedge my bets that that's Levini there, because it's around about the same time as he was one of the directors at the Ajax mine. So that's a that's nice little by the way. Apparently he was 70 and he took up painting, so he did actually eventually realise his dream of becoming an artist. Uh, the two watercolours here are of Sydney, uh, the Blue Mountains and, and the Heads, uh, Sydney Harbour. Uh, they're very large works. I wonder if he might have been producing them to uh, enter into the Sydney exhibition, the great exhibition of 1879. And I do know that he and Bertha went up to Sydney in the 1880s, uh, but I'm not quite sure whether they actually did, uh, were included in that exhibition or not. But he was very good, same as with his jewellery design, very fine workmanship, uh, attention to detail, but very much in the European style of painting. The gum trees aren't quite gum trees. They've got a very European look about them. But it's interesting that we have so many of those things of his in the collection as well. Another highlight of the 1880s was the visit of Eduard Remenyi, the famous gypsy, Hungarian gypsy violinist. He uh, was touring Australia at that time and he came to Bendigo and I think Levini went to that concert and made contact with him and encouraged him to have a concert here in Castlemaine, which he did, but it wasn't very well attended because it wasn't very well advertised apparently. But uh, Remini stayed here at Buda, uh, which would have been a fantastic thing for, for Ernest to have contact with him uh, at that time because I think he was around during the... Uh, uh, revolution as well, so they would have been able to reminisce about old times. Uh, Remenyi knew Brahms and Joachim and Liszt, so he was very well connected in the music world as well. That's one of the albums we have in the house with these little notes in it. This one written by Kate, I think, about Brahms, but this one in Remenyi's own hand. So Ernest died in 1905, apparently the wealthiest uh, man or la the biggest landholder at least in the area uh, and recognised for his contribution as an early pioneer and the first who opened the first jewellery store on the gold fields. So that's another thing that we get from his obituary. Here he is proudly standing outside his lovely home with his fez. He did smoke a pipe and did wear a smoking cap so um, I can just imagine that. We haven't found the smoking cap, but it uh, would <laughs> be nice to have. At the time of his death in 1905, he was said to be the wealthiest man in Castlemaine and paid tribute as a true pioneer of the community. Lavini is recognised among colonial silversmiths for his exceptional skill and competence as a designer and craftsman. He successfully merged his European artistic background with the uniquely Australian themes, epitomising in his works the great wealth, ambition and pride of the emerging nation. His ability to adapt to new surroundings and make friends easily, along with his intelligence and determination to find a way through the difficulties presented to him, saw him survive and eventually thrive in Australia. The place he finally chose to raise a family and call home. We're indebted to those who have, uh, through earlier research, raised an awareness of Levini and his work. In years past, in particular, Dr Egon Kunz and Mr Brian Poydevin. These people recognise the exceptional nature of Lavini and his story, which I've been privileged uh, to add to and to share with you today. Thank you all for your attention.